This morning we are in Titus chapter 1. Our passage this morning is verses 12 through 14. We have seen in Titus chapter number one thus far that there was a need for ordained elders in the churches on the island of Crete and Paul had done the work of evangelization and church planting there on the island and he left Titus there to continue the work in the churches that needed to be done and one of the main things that was needed in the churches was pastors were needed. And one of the reasons why this had been so urgent at that time was because of the threat of false teachers that were troubling the churches on the island itself. We saw last time, in verse number 10, that these false teachers were referred to as unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And Paul warns specifically about the circumcision, that group historically which was known as the Judaizers, and they were Jews who had professed faith in Christ, and they denied that we are justified through faith alone in Christ, but we're also adding works as uh, to the means by which we are justified. So we saw that. And then we saw in verse 11 the need for refutation of the false teachers and protection of the churches against them. In our passage this morning in verses 12 through 14, we're going to see that Paul is going to write concerning the sins on the island of Crete, of the people of Crete, and the corrupting influence which they were having upon those who had professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul is also going to write about what needed to be done in light of the situation. So let us begin in verse number 12, where Paul writes, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Here in our text this morning, we see that the Holy Spirit moved Paul to list some of the sins that the Cretans were known for as a people. Interestingly, he does not list these sins for us as evils that he simply observed on the island. But he actually, in verse 12 here, gives us a quote from a heathen source as a witness to the depravity that existed there on the island of Crete. Notice he wrote, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, and then he gives the quote. Now, anyone who wants to study out this passage, it will not take them long to find that uh, who he is talking about here, when he, or excuse, the one that he gives the quote from, was actually a 6th century B.C. Greek poet by the name of, there's different ways to pronounce it, but I'll pronounce it Epimenides. And the work which he quotes from was probably the work that we know of as concerning oracles. And he he's a well-known uh, poet at the time. In fact, if you just type his name in on the internet, you know, painting and everything of him well will pop up. He was well known. He was a highly esteemed individual in his time. He was even thought by the pagans to be inspired by the gods. He was a fortune teller. He was supposedly skilled in divination. And some of the things that he supposedly foretold also, it was said, came to pass. Paul refers to him as one of themselves because he was a Cretan by birth. He was born in the city called Gnosis on the island of Crete. And as the history goes, as he grew older, he was sent out to the field by his father in order to tend the sheep. And at noon, he turned aside and went into a cave and supposedly uh, fell asleep for 57 years. That's just some of the claims concerning this man. But it is important that Paul refers to Epimenides as one of themselves because he's using him as a witness against his own people in order to bring out some of the sins that existed there on the island of Crete. And notice, he not only refers to Epimenides as one of their own selves, but he also calls him a prophet of their own. Why does he call them, why does he call them a prophet of their own? There are different opinions as to why this might be. One of the reasons why people think, they, they think that Paul is 
speaking here ironically concerning this greek poet by they're thinking that paul is saying look such a prophet such a heathen prophet it was worthy of is is worthy of such a pagan island such as this in other words this pagan sinful island this is the best that they could produce a supposed prophet one of them own selves a prophet of their own so in other words it's believed that he's speaking in an ironic way there are others who think no that's not the case since Epimenides was a poet, Paul could refer to him as a prophet because it was the opinion at that time in the ancient world that poets were prophets. At the same time, and I think this is the best explanation, Epimenides was not only a prophet, but he was also into divination and fortune telling. And because fortune tellers had contact with demonic spirits, they could at times foretell of future events, and at times they would come to pass, but oftentimes their prophecies also fail because the information that they received wouldn't always be accurate if your prophecies were coming from demonic sources. And if you remember, Balaam in the book of Numbers was a prophet like this. He was into divination. He could foretell things that came to pass. And Peter refers to him as a prophet in his writings. 2 Peter 2, 15 and 16, Peter said this of Balaam. He says that he loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, the donkey, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. So you notice Balaam there was referred to in Scripture as a prophet. Not necessarily a faithful prophet of God, a diviner, a fortune teller, but nevertheless he was called a prophet in a certain sense. And that's the same way that many think that Paul is referring to Epimenides as a prophet. But these are some of the different reasons why Paul may be referred to him as such. But what was this man's testimony concerning the Cretans? Well, we see, first of all, he, he describes them in three different ways. He first says they were liars. Lying, which is willfully deceiving others to believe something that is false, we know is a common sin that all of us in here are probably committed. It is an evil practice that usually starts at an early age, and if someone has parents who have any common sense, they will seek to correct this in their children at a very early age. And it really is an outward testimony of the darkness and sinfulness of the stony heart which we are all born with as fallen sons and daughters of Adam. It has been said that lying is a sin that makes someone like the devil. And the reason why someone can say that is because of what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44 when he referred to Satan as a murderer from the beginning who abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And so those who are followers of Satan and practice lying on a regular basis are simply following the example of their spiritual father. And just as Satan will be cast into the lake of fire, as we saw in our Bible study this morning, so too all those who follow Satan in unrepentant lying will have the same destiny that he does. That is why Revelation 21.8 says, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and fire. Brimstone. And even, even later on in Revelation 21 and verse 27, when describing the heavenly kingdom and those who will not enter the heavenly kingdom, John wrote there in Revelation, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. And that's very valuable information for us who want to give the gospel to someone who's lost, who thinks that they are good, who do not see themselves as sinful or deserving of eternal hell, when they come, hopefully they can come to understand that that is simply not the case. If you have even been a liar in your life, mm -hmm. you cannot enter the kingdom. If you are a liar, you need the Savior, and you need to be converted. But here, when Paul quotes Epimenides as writing that the Cretans are always liars, he was saying that this was a sin that they were addicted to. It was a governing vice among them. At this time, even the Grecians used a phrase called to cretize, which was a proverbial way of referring to lying. That is how much they were known as a society to be a group of liars. 
So lying, which is a sin that has tainted all of fallen humanity, was yet a habitual practice among the Cretans. They were just a dishonest people. So he describes them as liars. And secondly, if you look there in verse 12, he describes them as evil beasts. These people are described as evil beasts because they were likened to those who would devour prey or those who were weaker than themselves. In Genesis chapter 37 and verse 20, when Joseph's brothers are talking about what they can do to Joseph, if you remember there, they said, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him. So there's a literal beast, a literal animal that would devour that which is weaker than it. Here, when Epimenides referred to his people as evil beasts, it's referring to the fact that the Cretans were a very cruel people. They were a very mischievous people. They, were, they had a brutal, savage way of life. And the false teachers who were disturbing the churches on the island of Crete not only would have necessarily been cruel to people physically, but spiritually. They were cruel concerning the souls of men. And then the third description here that is given, not only are they liars and evil beasts, but it's said that they were also slow-bellied. That's just another way of saying they were lazy, they were gluttonous, they were drunkards. They were not a people who had a strong inclination for work and honest labor. They were lazy and idle. It's interesting, too, how this may have been true among some of the false teachers there at Crete, because Paul, as he's quoting Epimenides, is not only describing the general people at Crete, but also those who were false teachers at Crete, because he's writing about the dangers of the false teachers. In Philippians 3.19, Paul says concerning false teachers that their God is their belly. Because instead of serving Christ, they serve their own bellies in laziness and eating the bread of others. So these were some of the great characteristics of the Cretans. Liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Now Paul gives this quote from Epimenides. And if you remember, he was a heathen source. Yet now look at the first part of verse 13. After he gives this quote, he says, This witness is true. So what's important for us is the apostle confirms that what this poet said was absolutely correct. He knew this by his own experiences, and as he made observations in his missionary work on the island of Crete, he could see this is the kind of people that they are. He did not say that everything Epimenides wrote was always correct in his poems. He does not even say that he was an inspired writer. But he's using him as a source from history as an accurate testimony of his own people. And Paul did this on more than one occasion. At times he would use sources from the Gentiles to prove a point. For example... If you look at Acts chapter 17 for a moment, stay there in Titus, but just look at Acts 17 and look at verses 28 and 29. Here in Acts 17, as Paul is preaching to those of the city of Athens in his missionary outreach, he is preaching to a people who have absolutely no Old Testament background. They simply had a pagan background. They were ignorant. concerning who God was. He says in verse 28, as he's preaching, for in him, that's referring to the Lord, for in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For so much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by the art of man's device. You notice here that Paul is proving a point that, look, if we are the offspring of God, it is ridiculous for us to think that a God can be made out of gold or silver or stone. Okay, and these people had no idea about the Old Testament scriptures, so he uses one of their own poets. This poet that he quotes, we know from history, was, uh, his name is pronounced Aratus. And Paul quotes this Greek poet here as he preaches to the pagans in Athens in his 
outreach. He simply wants to make a point to them. The idols that you have are absolutely foolish. Even one of your own poets says we are the offspring of God. How can we be the offspring of that which is made out of gold or silver or stone? So he does this on more than one occasion, quoting a source to prove a point. Now, there are some practical lessons that we can gain from this. Number one, because God is the source of all truth, all truth is God's truth. God can give light to lost sinners concerning certain truths. This does not mean that they are regenerated. This does not mean that they know God, but simply they can have correct understandings concerning certain eternal issues. So because of this, Paul could quote authors from the Gentiles, either to make a point concerning the Cretans or to make a point concerning those he was trying to reach in his outreach, in his preaching. Secondly, we have to understand that it is not wrong in and of itself to read certain books by the unregenerate authors. Such thinking is superstitious. Such reading, if it is used for good purposes and with a right motive, uh, it can be useful. At times in church history, some have gone a little too far concerning this issue. For example, in the 1500s, during the time of the Protestant Reformation with the Protestants and the Radical Reformation with the Anabaptists, some of the more radical Anabaptists believed in burning all books except the Bible. But in fact, Paul the Apostle would have never uh, considered such a thing. And so it should not shock us that Paul uses Gentile sources to prove points. And then a third practical thing I want to mention, in light of the fact that many today, even many homeschoolers, are getting back into giving their children so much of the heathen writers from the past and some of the classical pagans from the past, it's, it's better instead to ground the children in scripture, to ground them in the Christian classics like Bunyan and others, to ground them in accurate history, and then when they have a good foundation laid and when they're older, they can rightly examine false worldviews and dissect them properly because they already have a biblical worldview formed in their minds. And that's so important that we get that right because you see here Paul, who had a strong biblical worldview, who was grounded in scripture and in accurate history, could then rightly examine the worldviews of the pagans and refute them. And he could even use their sources for good reasons. So just some practical points there. But this island where Paul ministered, and the context now in which Titus found himself, was a culture in which the people in general had habits of dishonesty, laziness, and cruel behaviors. And isn't that interesting, brethren, that they were like that as a culture... But sadly, when you look at our own nation today, you see some of these characteristics in our culture, and it's just simply getting worse and worse and worse as we more and more turn away from a biblical influence. For example, just think of liars. Lying permeates our culture. Just think of the leftist media in our culture. In fact, if you really want to know what's going on, the leftist media can be very useful because all you got to do is watch them and know that whatever is true is the exact opposite usually of what they're saying. <laughs> right? Amen. It was like this way in the Soviet Union. Think of Russia during the time when Stalin reigned. They had two main newspapers. One of them was called Pravda, which simply means truth. The other one was called Izvestia, which means news. And it was a common saying there, there's no truth in Pravda, and there's nothing new in Izvestia. <laughs> because everyone knew that it's full of lies. Our culture is full of lies. Supposedly, we're to believe that we're all supposed to be scared to catch the flu, so we're not supposed to go to church, and in some states you're not supposed to sing, but it's okay to have revolutionaries out on the streets. Yeah. Because of lies. Evil beasts. When you think of those in our culture now who are not protesters, but revolutionaries, pillaging, rioting, burning, murdering, while at the same time, supposedly they say black lives matter, when in fact they could care less about black babies being slaughtered in the womb. Yeah. 
A lot of hypocrisy going on because they're evil beasts. Yes. Slow bellies. Think of how many in our culture are living off of the welfare system when they could work. And now, with the desire of having a Marxist redistribution of the wealth in our society, they want to more and more penalize the hardworking and those with initiative by taxing them more in order to reward those who are lazy. Because in our society, you have a lot of slow bellies who want to simply live off the system. Some of these characteristics we see then in our own nation, but now remember, our passage this morning was written in the context of Paul dealing with false teachers and warning Titus about false teachers. Let's look at the context again there in Titus 1. Look at verse 10 again just to get the context here to remember where we're at. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. And then he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. So he confirms that these false teachers who were disturbing the Cretans, not only were the Cretans liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, but this was also a characteristic of the false teachers themselves. This is a true witness. So what was to be done as a result? Look at the second part of verse 13. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So the false teachers on the island who had these characteristics had to be rebuked by Titus. Because of their false doctrine, because of their lying, deceit, idleness, and intemperance, they would badly affect others. So they were to be rebuked sharply. So Paul, by the Holy Spirit, lays down directions for Titus concerning such dangerous and immoral false teachers who were to be dealt with in the churches. Titus was a delegate of the apostle. He was to sharply rebuke them. When Paul writes here, rebuke them sharply, this could also be rendered in the English as rebuke them cuttingly, which has the idea of cutting to the quick and not sparing them laying open the nature of their evils that they were guilty with, with plainness and faithfulness. It may be a metaphor to a surgeon's work, who would cut open a wound, lay it open, and pull out the dead flesh. That's what Titus was to do. There are different ways that confrontation may take place in the church. For example, in Jude chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, if you remember there that passage, when Jude writes, and of some have compassion, making a difference, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. So there's different ways in which you deal with people, depending on their temperament, depending on the heinousness of the sin which they may be involved in. But here, when there was an actual teacher, or actual teachers, who were misleading others, they had to be rebuked for the well-being of the church so that others would not be led astray in their errors. And that's why, as we saw last month, 1 Timothy 5.20, concerning elders who were in sin. It could be an immoral lifestyle. It could be because of false teaching. But Paul wrote to Timothy saying, rebuke them in the presence of all. Why? So that the others will be fearful of sinning. So these kinds of rebukes, these kinds of reproving sharply is used for the good of God's people to keep them from also going astray. But another reason is so that the false teacher might be won back. As well, we see that here in Titus, because he says in verse 13 here, Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. That is, so that they could be recovered from their errors. That they might no longer follow that which is false, but receive the sound or the healthy doctrine. That they would receive Christ's words and truth. That they may return again to the knowledge of the truth. And so this is a good effect that can take place from sharp rebukes. Not only are God's people protected, but hopefully those who are going off into error, even these teachers, can be won back and they can be sound in the faith. And so sharp rebukes is always to be with good motives. There may be righteous anger in a situation like this when dealing with false teachers, but it also must be in love so that hopefully by God's grace, according to his will, they might be rescued out of the snare of the devil. And finally, look at verse 14. Rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. That's what Titus was to do. But now in verse 14, Paul reminds Titus again of what he is not to do. 
and of course what the believers at Crete were not to do. Not giving heed, he writes, to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Look here at three points from this verse. First of all, they were not to give heed to what he calls Jewish fables. In Paul's time, there were many fables or myths which the Jews had come up with concerning such matters as the creation, concerning the giving of the law, concerning the Messiah's coming earthly kingdom, and on other matters as well. Just for example, supposedly they said that during the Messiah's earthly reign, not only would we feast on fish and fowls and flesh, but we would also feast on behemoth and leviathan, as is mentioned in the book of Job. Uh, supposedly the wine that we would drink has been kept in a grape from the foundation of the world, they would say. Uh, supposedly at the resurrection, the dead will be rolling through caverns of the earth. And there's other fanciful tales and so forth that they would invent that just simply are not in Scripture. They were received traditionally from others, but there is nothing in Scripture that talks about such things. There is an example in Matthew chapter 15 concerning unbiblical traditions that existed among the Jews at that time. If you'd like to turn there for a moment in Matthew chapter 15. Here in Matthew chapter 15, he's not talking about fanciful tales or fables, but some traditional practices that were being forced upon the people that were not in Scripture at all. So, for example, look at chapter 15 of Matthew, verse number 1. It says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Not the tradition of Scripture, but the tradition of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So they come and they say, Look, why aren't your disciples following our traditions? Jesus comes and he makes a distinction between the commandments of God and your traditions. And he's going to use an example whereby following their tradition, they would actually violate the commandment of God. Look at verse 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So he's saying, Your tradition, which said that if you have... A, uh, an amount of money that should be used to honor their par honor your parents by taking care of them in their old age, your tradition is actually keeping you from obeying the commandments of God because your tradition, you're saying, no, I'm just going to give it as an offering all, all to the Lord. That's your tradition, but you're actually in violation of the fifth commandment of honoring your father and your mother. So you have an unbiblical tradition that is causing you to transgress the commandments of God. And then later in the passage, he talks about the washing the hands, this isn't a big issue. It's not what goes in that defiles you. It's not physical food. It's what comes out of the heart that defiles you. So oftentimes we simply see that these traditions of men that are not founded on Scripture at all are just a hindrance. And in fact, they can cause us to be disobedient to God's law. And you'll see that among a people. When they set aside the Word of God and when they set aside God's laws, they oftentimes bring in their own rules and regulations that have nothing at all to do with Scripture because God's law is not their standard. Man's traditions have become their standard. But here in our passage in Titus, Paul refers to unbiblical tales which existed among the Jews, in which these false teachers were very fond of. So Titus was not to give heed to this. Titus and the believers were not to give their ears to these worthless myths, because once scripture takes place in the heart, takes root in the heart, all such fables should become tasteless. They will not be attractive to godly minds. So that's, first of all, don't give heed to Jewish fables. And then secondly, in verse 14, he says, and the commandments of men. We talked a little bit about that a few moments ago, but especially that group that Paul referred to as the circumcision. Remember, they were obstinately bringing in old covenant ceremonies into the churches and causing great disturbance in the churches. While many of the Gentiles simply renounced their former ways of life when they were coming to Christ, many of these Jews 
were still hanging on to their old covenant ceremonies. Those ceremonies which had been abrogated under the new covenant. Since they had fulfilled their purpose and Messiah came and there was no reason to follow them anymore. So to claim that all Christians must follow these ceremonies under the new covenant was simply demanding of believers that they follow the commandments of men, not God's. Those ceremonies had served their purpose. God's people were not commanded to observe them anymore. Matthew Henry put it well when he wrote this. Jewish ceremonies and rites that were at first divine appointments, the substance having come in their season and use being over, are now but unwarranted commands of men, which not only stand not with, but turn from the truth, the pure gospel truth and spiritual worship set up by Christ instead of that bodily service under the law. So in other words, it's not that these old covenant ceremonies were bad. They were ordained of God. But they served their purpose. Now that the Messiah had come and fulfilled them, and the new covenant was brought in, those old covenant ceremonies were no longer needed. So to say that Christians must obey them and follow them was simply to give to the Christians commandments of men and not the commandments of God. And remember, some of these ceremonies, it was claimed, was a means by which we are saved, supposedly, according to these false teachers. So Paul writes to Titus, don't give heed to Jewish myths. And fables don't give heed to these commandments of men and why because he says at the end of verse 10 that turn from the truth that turn from the truth to follow these fables and commandments of men which is being promoted by the circumcision will lead one away from the truth it will turn people away from the truth that they had once professed to believe and they will ultimately abhor the gospel and they will abhor the truth of the gospel when you believe in the commandments of men and fables, which ultimately may destroy the message of the gospel itself, you will be turned away from the truth in the right way of salvation. John writes in 2 John that the truth will dwell with God's people forever. The truth, he says, dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. But concerning those who turn away from the truth, he writes in 2 Timothy 4.4, about individuals who turn their ears away from the truth and as a result they turn into fables because everyone follows someone everyone follows something if you're not going to follow the word of god you're going to follow the word of somebody else right. you hear it so many times these days in this secular age that we live in some people say yeah i grew up in church yeah i grew up with the bible but when i became an adult you know i think for myself now and i just don't follow what people taught me when in fact in reality they simply rejected the word of God and they began to follow somebody else. Right. Something they heard from television, something they heard from a classroom, something that they heard from a friend, and they begin to follow those philosophies. No one's so independent that they don't follow anybody. Everybody has opinions and beliefs and they follow someone or something. The question is, are they following fables or are they following the truth? Oftentimes you hear people say, yeah, such and such used to be a Christian, but uh, such and such a person turned them away. But the question is, what did they now turn to? They turned to something. And if it is not the truth, it is simply fatal. So, the Cretans were a wicked lot. The false teachers at Crete were a wicked bunch as well, following the ways of their culture. That was sinful. They were to be rebuked by Titus so that they would be sound in the faith. And then there war he's warned him and the believers don't give heed to these fables and commandments of men because they turn men from the truth. Mm. Brethren, think of some practical matters with me for a moment. Let's remember, brethren, in light of our passage today, to beware of traditions and commandments of men in our own day that can turn us away from the truth. Scripture must always be our guide. That's why we believe in sola scriptura. The scriptures are our final authority in all matters of faith, conduct, and doctrine. When I think of traditions of men and churches that hold to traditions of men that have been used by the evil one to completely destroy the gospel message, I can't help but to think again of Roman Catholicism. Because Roman Catholicism teaches that 
that it is not the scripture alone that is our final authority according to their official doctrine, but it's also sacred tradition which is of equal authority and on par with scripture as an authority. And what really happened historically within the Church of Rome is you twist scripture, you pervert scripture, and then you make it fit with your traditions, and what happens is, is the message of the gospel is completely gone, the way of salvation is completely gone, and you invent a whole nother religion, not based upon scripture, but based upon your tradition. And how many people have been led astray and have been led into hell because of the false church of Roman Catholicism? Because they fell into this very thing. The commandments of men, the traditions of men, brought in and added in and brought in as an equal authority to Scripture. That's why there had to be a Reformation. And that's why prior to the Reformation, so many groups such as the Waldensians and the Lollards were persecuted by the Church of Rome because they stepped back away from the traditions of men and said, Scripture is now our authority. Or think about in our modern day among supposed evangelicals, pseudo-reformers, the neo-Calvinists, the new reformed, who are giving over left and right to this supposed social justice movement. And supposedly, according to many of these so-called Christians, now the, the white man is supposed to make reparations because of sins that our ancestors supposedly committed years ago. I don't know how many of your ancestors were slave traders, but brethren, or not involved slave traders necessarily, but who had slaves, you're not responsible for that. And I don't know what someone like me is supposed to do. My ancestors were not even here when slavery existed in this country. But in fact, in the 1800s, they were being mistreated by the Russians because they were Germans in Russia. Yeah. Does that mean if I meet a Russian brother in a church, I'm supposed to say, I want reparations because of what you did to my ancestors? It's ridiculous. It is divisive. Yep. It's a tool of Satan yes. to divide the churches. Yes. Think of Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Think about this. Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. To say that supposedly we need forgiveness and we have to make reparations and this is a vicious cycle where there is no forgiveness, it is a heresy, it is a false gospel. Yes. And just because someone holds the name evangelical or reformed doesn't make them immune. They certainly aren't standing in the faith of the reformers, that's for sure. Many of the hip-hop reformed following the ways of the world. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, speaking of regeneration, faith, justification, and forgiveness, says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Those who have been made alive in Christ, who have experienced the new birth, have been forgiven of all their trespasses. In the church, there is no more reparations to make. So beware of the traditions of men, whether traditions of Rome or traditions of many in the evangelical world. Yeah. Also, brethren, another practical point that we see here from our passage is this. Some nations are distinguished by their vices. In our modern day, in certain contexts, this could really be politically incorrect. But in reality, according to God's holy word, certain nations, people groups, and communities may have certain sinful tendencies and habits which characterize them as a people. Because as a people, they simply have been given over to those vices. Lying, cruelty, laziness, gluttony, drunkenness were all sins that plague all nations and peoples, yet they were very common sins we saw among the Cretans, possibly even more than many other cultures. That's why, think about what the Holy Word says here. The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Directly from the Word of God saying that this was a people that was distinguished because of these sins. Mm. Scripture, in fact, does this a lot. 
Let me just give you a few examples. Think of the city-states of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. They were a people that were characterized because of certain vices among them. And they were more in the depths of depravity in those sins than other nations around them. That is why they were destroyed with fire and brimstone. Ezekiel 16, verse 49 says this about Sodom. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So what were they distinguished by? Their pride their laziness, and their cruelty. And then in Jude chapter 1 and verse 7, it says concerning the people of Sodom, they gave themselves over to fornication, and they went after strange flesh. So the people of Sodom, and you could also say the people of the surrounding cities around the Dead Sea area, were given over to these sins. These sins characterized them as a people. They were perverted. They were immoral. They were prideful. They were lazy. They were cruel, and because of that, they were judged with fire and brimstone. How about another example? Think about the people of Canaan. They were distinguished also because of their sins in comparison to other nations, and because of that, they were going to be severely judged by God. If you would, look with me for a moment at Leviticus chapter 18. Keep your finger, if you would, there at Titus again, but look at Leviticus chapter number 18. And look here at verses 20 through 24. As God gives his law to Israel. And he's telling them these are certain things that are not to be done in Israel. Verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Forbidden adultery. Not to exist in Israel. Verse 21. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am Yahweh. Child slaughter, not to exist. You're not to kill your child and burn them to Molech, not to exist in Israel. Verse 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. Sodomy was not to exist in Israel, forbidden. Verse 23, neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. So what was all forbidden here just in these few verses? Adultery is forbidden, child slaughter is forbidden, sodomy is forbidden, bestiality is forbidden. But then all of what he says in verse 24, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these things the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. Now look at verse 25, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. God was going to use Israel as a tool to judge these nations, to slaughter the men, the women, and the children. The land was going to vomit them out because they were characterized by these very evil iniquities. Let me give you one more example. The Jews during the time of Christ and during Paul's time. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you can turn there if you'd like, Look at what Paul says here about the Jews as a people. Now, he's not talking about every Jew. He's not talking about the Jews who had followed Christ and who were in the church. He's talking about the Jews as a nation of people, what they were doing. He says here in chapter 2, look at verses 14 through 16. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath of God is come upon them to the uttermost. Notice what he says about the Jews as a nation at that time. They had rejected their Messiah. Of course, in the past at times, during times of apostasy, they were killing their own prophets. They rejected the Messiah, they crucified the Messiah, and now they were persecuting his servants and those who were following Christ. And they were trying to hinder the message of salvation from going out to the Gentiles. What was their sin? Apostasy and persecution of God's people. And because of that, they were also going to be judged by God. This is something that I knew in the past, but I didn't know the depths of it so much because... I didn't know so much of the history that took place 
But it's very, very clear at that time when the Jews crucified the Messiah and were persecuting God's people that God's judgment was going to come upon them because of that. They were distinguished as a people because of their apostasy and their persecution of Christ and his people. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 when he came into Jerusalem at Passion Week? This is what he foretold would take place. He said to the Jews in Luke 19 verses 41 through 44, Weeping, he said, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies, that's the Romans, shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Because of their rejection and crucifixion of Christ, God's judgment was coming. Peter preached in Acts, you receive the Messiah, the times of refreshing will come. But they were rejecting Christ, and as a result, the judgment would fall. I don't know how familiar some of you are with the history of what happened in Jerusalem at that time in AD 70 when judgment fell, because the scriptures don't give a lot of detail, but history does. And the well-known church historian from the 4th century by the name of Eusebius quotes Josephus, the Jewish historian, who was alive during the time of the judgment that took place upon the Jews in AD 70. And let me just read you just a little bit of how this was described. I want you to think about the judgment upon a people because of their sins. Here's what the history says. This was when the Romans were surrounding Jerusalem and the famine broke out in the city. The possibility of going out of the city being brought to an end, all hope of safety for the Jews was cut off. And the famine increased and devoured the people by houses and families. And the rooms were filled with dead women and children, the lanes of the city with the corpses of old men. Children and youths, swollen in the famine, wandered about the marketplaces like shadows and fell down wherever the death agony overtook them. The sick were not strong enough to bury their own relatives. And those who had the strength hesitated because of the multitude of the dead and the uncertainty as to their own fate. Many indeed died while they were burying others, and many betook themselves to the graves before death came upon them. There was neither weeping nor lamentation under these misfortunes, but the famine stifled the natural affections. Those that were dying a lingering death looked with dry eyes upon those that had gone to their rest before them. Deep silence and death-laden night encircled the city. And then Jerusalem turned into a madhouse. Listen to this. Robbers were more terrible than these miseries, for they broke open the houses which were now mere sepulchres, robbed the dead, and stripped the covering from their bodies, and went away with a laugh. They tried the points of their swords in the dead bodies, and some that were lying on the ground still alive, they thrust through in order to test their weapons. But those that prayed that they would not use, that they would use their right and their sword upon them, they contemptuously left to be destroyed by the famine. Every one of these died with eyes fixed upon the temple. And then finally, the history says this. Of those that perished by the famine in the city, the number was countless, and the miseries they underwent unspeakable. For if so much as the shadow of food appeared in any house, there was war, and the dearest friends engaged in hand-to-hand -hand conflict with one another, and snatched from each other the most wretched supports of life. Nor would they believe that even the dying were without food, but the robbers would search them while they were expiring, lest anyone should feign death while concealing food in his bosom. With mouths gaping for want of food, they stumbled and staggered like mad dogs and beat the doors as if they were drunk, and in their impotence they would rush into the same houses twice or thrice in one hour. Necessity compelled them to eat anything they could find, and they gathered and devoured things that were not fit for the filthiest of rational, irrational beasts. Finally, they did not abstain even from their girdles and shoes, and they stripped the hides off the shields and devoured them. Some used even wisps of old hay for food, and others gathered stubble and so forth. But as you can see, the famine, the starvation, and no longer any sympathy even for the weakest and those who had been the most delicate and those who had the strongest of relationships became enemies of one another as God turned them on one another in the famine to destroy one another just for a little bit of food. That's 
the judgment, the serious judgment that God brought upon them for their rejection of the Messiah and for the persecution of his people. This is a serious issue. What about in our own nation? A nation which is full of apostasy, the shedding of innocent blood, immorality, perversion, and pride. Pride concerning perversion. I don't right. say this as a joke, but it, it was been said by someone else. It was for gay pride that Sodom got fried. Mm. It's because of sin that God brings judgment on these nations. A nation so depraved as Crete, though, and here's the good news before we close. A nation so depraved as Crete, and this is so practical for us in light of our own situation, a nation so depraved as Crete and so infamous was still among the first to partake of the gospel. They were among the first to partake of the gospel. Grace was given to those who did not even deserve to live in this world. And in the midst of a corrupt nation, which was a taste of hell itself, the church of Jesus Christ was being built and extending. And that's how it will continue to be until he comes back in judgment. Titus would have to rebuke the corruptions in the church because the evils of the society were coming into the church and affecting the professing believers in the church. And we know that we have this today, brethren. Think about this. I have to just get a drink here for a moment. Think about the society around us and the position that we are in. We're in the midst of a wicked society like Crete. At the same time, you have influences from the world coming in. You have churches accepting BLM and Marxism because they are so affected by the influences of the culture, so they're bringing that into the church. Our responsibility as believers, instead, instead of following that way, is in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation to be the lights that shine. Because we recognize in the midst of a wicked society, in the midst of a wicked generation, in the midst of apostasy and compromise in the churches, Christ is still building his church. And wicked sinners like us are still being saved yeah. and still will be saved. And God's will will be done perfectly yeah. in judgment and in grace. Yeah. And the hope of our day is not a social justice Marxist gospel, which is simply the solution of atheists. But our hope is the gospel. Because the problem in our society is not inequality, it's not white supremacy, and it's not capitalism. The, promise, or the problem in our society is sin. Yep. And when you understand that the problem is sin, then you understand what the right solution has to be. The sin, the problem is fatherlessness, immorality, family breakdown, and ultimately rebellion against God. When we understand that, we understand our only hope is what is pictured here in the Lord's Supper of the Gospel. Amen. The crucified Christ who took our sins upon himself and bore the penalty that we deserved and then rose again from the dead. The Christ who we recognize as we partake of the Lord's Supper who is coming again Amen. to judge and to reign in glory. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word of truth. Without it, we would be lost and in darkness. Thank you, Lord, that in a sinful world, and even in the midst of our world and our time, that the situation that you have ordained for us, we stand here and we realize that we are not the first Christians or believers to be in such situations. This is life in a fallen world. Societies come and go. Apostasy comes and goes according to your providential plan. And Lord, we thank you that in our situation you have a grace and mercy upon us. That you have revealed to us through your word and by the power of your spirit the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your crucifixion, your sacrificial death on that cross, your resurrection, and that you are our hope, our only hope. 
our only hope that we cling to. That we thank you that you are building your church. You are saving your sheep. We praise you that no matter what the world may do, the gates of hell will never prevail against your church. You may turn the hearts of kings this way or that. In your providential plan, you will make sure that your church is built. That your sheep are kept safe in your hand. We give you the praise now and the glory. And we pray in your name. Amen.